Hey, let me encourage you to stay standing for the reading of God's word today. We are approaching Jonah chapter 3, and we are looking at just a few verses. And so you'll get your Bible out. We will be done in the blink of an eye, and then you will be able to sit down. This is Jonah chapter 3. These are our verses for this morning. This is the word of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. This is today's passage. You may be seated. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Everyone doing well? Great. Few of you are, that's all I care about, just the few that responded, the rest of you, tough luck. I don't know what to tell you. Um, just wanna say hi, I'm Pastor Scott, I'm one of the uh, pastors here, the lead pastor at DOXA, and uh, joy to have you here today. And so if you have your Bibles, why don't you grab them? That's what we're going to be doing for the rest of our time is we're just going to dive deep into God's word and uh, into Jonah chapter three is where you're going to be. It's one of those minor prophets, so it might be hard to get to, but just lean over to a neighbor. People at Docs are nice <laughs> for the most part, right, church? Yeah, willing to help, willing to help. And listen, if you're online watching, I can't get you there, I mean, but you got a table of contents, and we'd love to have you get to Jonah, and we're glad that you're watching online and uh, grateful for this opportunity to use technology in this way so we can be together even as you're apart from us here, and uh, just grateful to be in this series. It's a series called Sent, and the whole idea of this is, man, we have so many things in our heads that get us off mission, and Christians need to be on mission Sometimes the reason why our Christianity doesn't really come out that clear is because we aren't actually on the things that God wants us to be on. And so we're making very clear that our church exists to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus Christ. And if we're going to make those disciples the way Jesus wants them made, we're going to make them of all nations. So you've seen that emphasis in this series, right? Started in translating a book of the Bible to a people group that did not have really any of the Bible in their language. And in nine days, our church funded that entire project. Praise be to God. Do you want to clap about that? I think that's awesome too. God is good. And then we pivoted because in the providence of God, we've had this scenario going on in Afghanistan where immediately we jumped on that train and said, we're going to help our brothers and sisters. We're going to help people who are going to be displaced in the midst of all that's going on. It got worse this week, didn't it? Let's be praying for these people. Let's be praying for our brothers and sisters. What doesn't hit the news is what they're doing to Christians who hold fast to the name of Jesus Christ. So let's pray for their strength. Let's pray for their peace. Let's pray for that heart of Paul that says to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And let's pray that for them, right? And so we're here and we're thinking about it from our context and, and we have some stuff going on in our lives, don't we? Some pressing issues, some jobs at stake, some realities that we're wrestling through and, and we need to be mission-minded. And so we come to this book of the Bible because Jonah was sent, was he not? Now the level of success of his being sent is kind of in question, but that's what we're studying. And so we come to chapter three, and the title of the message today is this, and it's a good, good topic, fashioned for a fresh start. How many thank the Lord for fresh starts in their life? It's so good. Where are we at in the book of Jonah? Jonah's been chewed up and spit out and don't do it. Don't do it. And I was going to say, and in the words of the psalmist, Psalm 118, the Lord has disciplined me severely. It says in Psalm 118, verse 88, the Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. That's Jonah's situation. Maybe you found yourself in one of those situations before, but you're like, I'm alive. I'm here. I'm breathing. And listen, if you're not dead, the Lord is not done with you, okay? 
If you are here and you are taking in air, God wants to speak to you through his word today. He wants to, well, Jonah's going to get a fresh start today by God's sheer grace. But what I need you to see before we even get to that and how do we approach fresh starts in our lives, I need you to see that God fashions you for fresh starts even in your failures. I need you to see that in the progression of the book of Jonah, I need you to see that God is doing work even in your failures, Christians, to shape you. What I mean is if you look at the story of Jonah so far as we have it, Jonah's botched obedience has not deterred God from shaping his servant for service. Personalize it a little bit. Your sin does not stop God from making you into a useful servant. God's shaping doesn't cease during your sinful setbacks. It's not like you sin and God goes, oh, could you get over that so we could get back to work? God is so sovereign and so stunningly good that even in the moments where you sin, God is taking even your sin and leveraging it to fashion you for a fresh start in his direction. And how do I know that? Because we hold fast to certain promises, Christians, like Romans 8:28. We know that God for those who love him and are called according to his purpose, works all things out together for good. If all things doesn't include our sin as well, that's not a great promise. But he's working all things out for our good. Christians, for our good. What's our good? Well, he continues on. We don't make up good. Oh, for our good. We get to interpret that ourselves. No, we just keep reading the Bible. Verse 29 of Romans 8 says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, here it is, to be conformed to the image of his son. God is shaping you even in your sin, in fact, especially sometimes in your sin, to be conformed to the image of his son that you might look like Jesus as you're serving Jesus. God isn't wasting your prodigality now, here's what I'm not saying. To be clear, what I'm not saying right now is that God fashions you in your, that he does that, doesn't excuse or encourage disobedience, okay? So what I'm not saying is kind of the Romans 6 idea. Should I abound in sin so that grace may superabound? And Paul says, by no means. So that's not what I'm saying. I'm also not saying that God takes disobedience lightly. He doesn't. What I'm saying is useful tools have to be shaped for effectiveness and that shaping doesn't stop or pause during your season or time of prodigality. And that's the story of Jonah. God has leveraged this season, this time, this moment of disobedience and what he's done is he's brought the heat in his discipline that has melted the hard heart. In the midst of the storm that Jonah endured, he brought the sparks that shape the stubborn spirit, and from the depths of the water, he showed Jonah a grace to a self-righteous soul that would be the framework for him actually going and being sent to the nation of Assyria, the city of Nineveh. So big idea is a big idea today but I think it's profound, and I think it's what we see as we enter into the text this morning, okay? This is such a great, great thing for us. God is at work, even in our sinful failures, to reform reluctant servants under readiness for kingdom responsibility. And I will sit for a second, because I know some of you are like, don't you dare take that off the screen right now. I am three words of writing in, and you've already said it. This is, this is profound. And it's kind of moving through this transition into chapter 3 that God is at work even in our sinful failures to reform reluctant servants. By the way, if you're like, who, who, I wonder who the reluctant servant is. You, you are. Okay, you are. 
And what is he doing? He's reforming reluctant servants under readiness for kingdom responsibility. God had to work for Jonah. Jonah said no. God leveraged that time of disobedience, even in that time, shaping a tool to be useful for kingdom responsibility. Reforming reluctant servants under readiness for kingdom responsibility. Yes and amen. So, now we can get to the fresh start. Now that we understand that God is fashioning us even in our failures, four fresh starts, how do we then approach a fresh start? How are we fashioned by God to approach fresh starts when he gives them to us? And praise God, he does, doesn't he? And honestly, if it was our life, it wouldn't be one fresh start or two fresh starts or three fresh starts. It'd be, I don't have enough fingers for the fresh starts, right? This is the mercy of God. So here's what I want you to see about your fresh start. If God's given you one today, if you're going to walk in one in some time, we are going to all be in one of these at one point or another. He gives us a new, it's a new opportunity. That's how you have to see your fresh start. He gives us a new occupation and he gives us a new orientation. And that's what we're going to see in the text today. A new opportunity. What do you see your fresh start as? Man, this is a new opportunity. It is a new occupation and every fresh start has a new orientation. And so I'll show you that this morning. Here we go. Fashion to approach a fresh start in this way. Number one, see your fresh start as a new opportunity or grace. This is huge. Here's what the text says. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Second times are grace times. Second times are mercy times. Okay, Jonah did not deserve a second chance, did he? What is, what, what is deserved of our disobedience? And this might, if you're not a Christian, this is going to sound offensive to you, but this is clear from God's word. One obedience, excuse me, disobedience is what? What is it deserving of? Death. For the wages of sin is death. It takes one disobedience. If you disobey the Lord, you deserve to die. You deserve to die and to be separated from God forever. You're like, well, that seems intense. Well, listen, it's two things. Number one, it's who you sinned against. And number two, apart from the intervening work of the Holy Spirit, you will only ever continue to sin, and therefore you will be punished in that way. So what Jonah deserves is death. Jonah deserved that the prison bars of the netherworld were to come over him like we read in the last chapter. Instead, the Lord swallows him up via a sovereign fish, spits him out, and now he is back to another opportunity to obey. This is such mercy from the Lord. Now, what did we see from Jonah last week? He repented of his sin, which is turning from your sin, turning towards the Lord, and he pleaded with God. He appealed to God for his mercy, and so the Lord has spit him out, and recommissioned him, which, listen, if you are being recommissioned to the Lord's work, you can be sure of the fact that the Lord has forgiven. The Lord has re-enlisted you to his service. It's a sign that God's not done with you yet. I mean, the truth is, we all pull Jonas. And it's the prideful one that goes, I don't do that stuff that needs to go back to the chapter before and learn about mercy and how desperately in need of it you are. But for most of us, if we've been following the pattern of Jonah, we recognize that we all pull Jonahs. Like we pulled, some of us pulled a Jonah this morning. We pulled a Jonah yesterday. There was an opportunity to obey the Lord and we did what? Reluctance sat in. Distractions set in, passions set in, idols set in, and we didn't obey. So what happens in those moments? If that's in some sense the Christian life, right? It's kind of a one step forward, two steps back, two steps forward, one step back, constantly, ever increasingly moving in the direction of Jesus. What do we do in those moments when we're disobedient? 
Listen, we die to self again and again and again and again. One of the principles that's going on in the book of Jonah and applies to us today is as God's giving this fresh start to Jonah, fresh starts are God working life in you out of death. That's what Jonah is a sign of, Jesus will say. That as God worked life out of Jonah's death for the sailors, and as God will work life for the Ninevites out of Jonah's death, so Jesus will come, dying not for his own sin, but truly dying in the place of sinners, that by his death we may be brought life. And then what you see in the Christian life is though we continue to sin, we're not perfect. Our hearts have been changed, yes. New disposition, new desires for Jesus. When we turn from our sin and put our faith in Jesus Christ as the free gift of God's grace, we have new desires and new affections, but it doesn't mean perfect obedience. We have to continually press back into the gospel for the pattern of our life is out of death comes life. Jonah's fresh start is a reminder that out of death comes life in Christ, ultimately. That he is by faith trusting in this principle. When we have sinned and there is a setback, we go back to what is true of us in the gospel. We go back to the fact that we are to walk in newness of life. And what's interesting is strewn across the New Testament, what you see again and again and again is this picture of how the death of Jesus informs the way we live for Jesus, especially in those moments that we have setbacks. So so what do I mean by that? Listen, when you're talking about your identity in Christ, what does Paul remind us of? But that every time, and especially in the times when you need to remember this, Galatians 2.20 says that I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That is needed in the moment of our sinful setbacks. What about in holiness? What's the pursuit of holiness? You'll be surprised that it's actually connected to death, that out of death brings life. Paul says that we ought to present ourselves to God as those who have been brought from death into life. That's how he talks about our holiness. We need to see ourselves in light of that. Paul says his empowerment for life as a Christian is becoming like Jesus in his death so that he might share in the power of his resurrection. When you think about evangelism and how Paul saw evangelism, he said it like this in 2 Corinthians 4, he's always being given over to death so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. In one of the parables, Jesus is speaking about, in a transition, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. This is the Jonah principle at play, now about to be fleshed out. The word of the Lord comes to him a second time. How does he respond? Out of death comes new life. And for us, we see that as, hey man, we have died to ourselves in that sinful thing. We have repented of our sin, but now we move forward. And as we move forward, we move forward trusting in the death of Jesus to atone for our sins and by his new life through G- our new life through Jesus Christ we walk in confidence and in power and in hope that God will leverage our dying moments that we may bear much fruit and so prove to be Jesus Christ's disciples we see this as a new opportunity God's graciously giving it and it's the principle of death producing life that just makes its way through the pages of this letter. This is all grace from the Lord. What grace? A fresh start sees it as, we see it as a new opportunity. God's grace all over our fresh starts. Out of death, we've died to self, we've repented of our sin, we're moving forward, now we're walking in that newness of life. 
Then he transitions here and continues with the statement. What's the second aspect of a fresh start? How do we approach it? Not just a new opportunity, but we see it as a, there's a new occupation for us. There's a new occupation we lay hold of. When we've sinned and we enter back in for a fresh start, we have our mindset on one thing. We're looking to please the Lord Jesus Christ in our obedience to him. Notice what the text continues and says, and the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. Does that sound familiar? Chapter 1, verse 2. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Same verbs. Same message. Are you listening? So, Lord, say something a little bit different there. Seems like the Lord's saying something slightly different. Seems like the first time Jonah is given the reason for the mission. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, call out against it. Why? For their evil has come up before me. This time, the stress is on something different. It's on delivering God's words, saying exactly what I want you to say. In other words, arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. In the first instance, we get this understanding that the message was given to Jonah. In the second one, the emphasis is on you need to be in lock, step, obedience to me. I haven't told you exactly what you're going to say, but you're going to go and you're going to say exactly what I tell you to say. By the way, that's just a good philosophy for preaching. We don't need to fluff it up. We don't need to make it cool. We don't need to make it relevant. We don't need to change it to make it acceptable to people. You need to preach it as it is, exactly what I tell you to say. He's focusing on two things that are crystal clear that he wants lockstep obedience in. Number one, preach exactly what I tell you to preach. Number two, do it in Nineveh. But here's how we play games with God. Ready? Obedience is not preaching exactly what God tells him to preach somewhere other than Nineveh. You're like, got it, Lord. I'll pick the location, but I got it. No, 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 no. Proclamation and place are part and parcel of the obedience call here. Same thing is true on the flip. You're like, cool, got swallowed by a fish. Now I'm down to go to Nineveh. Sounds good, but I'm going to preach something a little bit more. I don't know if this is going to work with the people, I don't seem to particularly be fond of our God. So you know what, Lord? Got it. I'm going to give my kind of rendition of it. That's also disobedience. He's made it crystal clear. And the reason why I'm harping on this is because obedience begins with God speaking and you hearing exactly what he says. You need to listen closely. You need to study deeply. You need to not be like Eve, who was trying to explain what the Lord had told her about the tree. Do you remember that? And Eve's like, got it. It It's crystal clear. Not supposed to eat of that tree or touch it. Right? Now, is that what the Lord said? No, she added to the word of the Lord. It turns out we have this, sometimes we have this confidence that we know what the Lord means, but we really don't know what he means, or we've heard more than what he's actually said. And if we're going to be obedient, it starts with active listening. It starts with getting our attention onto the text, the word of God. Did you, did you know this? Did you know? Did you know that in Scripture, hearing and obeying are basically inseparable. Did you guys know that? Do you know when the Bible says hearing in the Old Testament, do you know the exact same word for hearing is also the word obeying in the Hebrew? It's like two sides of the same coin. 
Did you know in the Greek that the word for hearing is akuo, and the word for obeying is hupakuo, which is essentially to hear under, like come under in submission to and walk out. This is the desire of the Lord. Truly what he's saying is you can't actually listen truly if you aren't obeying completely. You're like, well, I'm listening, Lord. I'm listening, I'm listening. Are you obeying? No. Well, then you're not listening. I think sometimes we get ourselves off the hook because it's like, oh, I'm listening, I'm listening, I'm listening to the Lord. Getting a lot of weird messages, but I'm listening. You obeying any of it? No. Well, that's a problem. The point of what seems to be clear of God's word from beginning to end is that in God's mind, hearing and obeying are one in the same. Let me ask you, how is your hearing of God's word, really? Like when we think about coming back to a fresh start, we need to think about coming back to basic principles of Christianity. You coming back to a fresh start, you have died to yourself again. And we're going to die to ourselves a lot in the process, right? We're going to repent of our sin. We're going to walk in newness of life. What is the first thing God wants us to do? He wants us to please him in obeying him. That's what he wants us to do. And I think sometimes we can get ahead of ourselves. I've been a Christian for that many years. I don't even think about it that simply. And yet we ought to think about it that simply. You think about examples with Jesus, with the parable of the two sons, for example, right? Father goes to his son, asks one of his sons, hey, I need you to go work in the field. His answer, no, yes right? Starts with a no, then he figures it out, and he does what? He does it. Then he goes to his other son, right? His pious son. And he goes, son, I need you to go work in the vineyards. Yes, no. Jesus asked the specific question, which one of these did the will of his father? Answer, the no yes guy, right? The no yes guy, because ultimately he was obedient, you switch the subject. You go to the parable of the two builders in Matthew chapter 7, a very famous passage for vacation Bible school. Right? And you, you build the whole thing, and you have like hand motions for saw, and the whole, maybe just my world. Okay, so, but, but adults, you know you need that too, Right? There's two types of people. One builds their house in the sand. One builds their house in the rock. The difference is both have heard the word of God, but one's actually really heard the word of God. Do you see what I'm saying based on what I've been saying? One has heard the word of God and decided not to do it, so the storm comes and the flood comes and bam, the house is completely wiped out. The other person hears the word of the Lord and obeys and their house is like a a house on a rock so that when the flood comes and the storm comes, it is not swept away. We're to be like that. That is to be the story of our lives. So let's get back to the basics. How does your obedience look right now? And if you're like, man, I'm just kind of convicted. I know exactly what you're talking about. I have an area in my life. Do you have something? Do you have spiritual Q-tips for me? Because my ears aren't working. Here's what I would say, according to the Bible, you don't really get spiritual Q-tips when your ears aren't working. Instead, when your ears aren't working, the Bible says you need to check under the hood of your heart when your ears aren't working. Okay? So when you're not in lockstep obedience with the Lord, gladly, you need to take a look under the hood of your heart. And if I were to give you just some categories, okay, let's just spitball here and use the categories of the parable of the sower, to evaluate your heart. Four hearts, right? Stubborn heart, superficial heart, strangled heart, soft heart. Right? Those are the, those are the hearts in the parable of the sower. In this room, there are people with a stubborn heart. And the reason you don't hear is because it's a heart issue. You are hardened to the Lord. You are hardened to his word. Perhaps you have been hurt by something in the past or more more specifically, your sin is keeping you from submitting your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you come in with a hard-heartedness You come in maybe like Jonah did where you're like, hey, I'm a follower of Yahweh, but I'm not wild about his mercy going to people that don't deserve it. 
And so you have a stubborn heart, a hard heart, but that's not the only kind of heart in the parable of the sower. Maybe for you, it's a superficial heart where you're like, man, I'm down with this whole church thing, but only when you say nice things. And the superficial heart is that heart that just is itching to hear what you already agree with. If you come to church and your gauge is, I like this pastor or don't like his pa- this pastor based on what I agree with on what he said, that's not the way to evaluate church. The, the way to evaluate church is, does he preach the word and am I coming underneath that? But that's what has to be the focus. And so with the superficial heart, it's like, man, there are so many people in a, with a superficial kind of approach to Christianity, right? But when something is hard, when something is difficult, you're like, man, I'm out of there. So you don't hear, you don't obey. What about a strangled heart? Some of you, man, you can't hear, you aren't compelled, you aren't on the edge of your seat looking to obey God from his word because you are so strangled by the love of this world. You love your money, you love the prestige of your job, you love your entertainment, you love all of these things, and so you're like, I want to squeeze Jesus in, that's why I'm here. But I need to squeeze him in. And Jesus is like, I'm looking to take over. Like, I'm looking to shove all of that stuff out. And maybe some of that comes back, but it comes back under my lordship. But at the beginning, when you start a fresh start, it's just better to have Jesus just go, take it all out. And then under his lordship, decide what comes back in. And then, of course, there's the fourth heart. There is the soft, receptive heart. And I trust that many of you are here hungering for the word, desiring the word. The reality of what Jonah is facing as he hits this fresh start is, is he occupied with obedience? Is he going to take the word of the Lord, hear it truly, and thus that means what? Obey it, right? This is the beginning of a fresh start. You see, oh my goodness, God gave me a new opportunity. That is totally his grace because anytime I've disobeyed him, I deserve to die. So anything else is grace. How am I doing? Better than I deserve. So now because of the grace of God, once again seen and the dying to self, I'm going to now spend my life once again renewed in the purpose to please him through obedience. Overwhelmed? Okay, well here's the cool thing about obedience and coming back to fresh starts. It's one foot in front of the other. Take all thing and walk in it in obedience. Take another thing and walk in it in obedience. Take another step and walk in it in obedience. Listen, if you're a new Christian, that's how you grow. And every step of the way, God will be faithful to empower you with his spirit to strengthen you in that new occupation. But the Lord doesn't share the message with them. He says, I want you to rise. I want you to go to that great city, Nineveh, And I want you to call out against it the message that I told you or that I tell you. It's coming. He doesn't know it yet. So what do you do in that transition between getting there and receiving the message and where he is with the call to go? This is where the orientation part comes in, okay? When you approach a fresh start by God's grace, you see it as a new opportunity. You see yourself with a new occupation. It's so simple, obedience by God's spirit, obedience to the word of the Lord. And then this, a new orientation onward. Onward. Not sure what he's gonna call me to do. Not sure what he's gonna call me to say. But I need to move onward. Let's see what Jonah does. So Jonah arose and he went to Nineveh. Should we celebrate his obedience? Oh, you guys are half heartedly excited. I think this is a big win. I think when the, when the Lord sees us in obedience to him, I think it's a win. We're going to kind of find out that there's some remaining sin in Jonah's life, aren't we? But wait, 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 wait. But you don't have any of that, right? No, you're like, you've been a Christian for 30 years. You don't got any of that. You feel bad for Jonah. Oh, loved ones. 
this is good stuff for us. But he's not in that moment. He's in the obedience moment, and we're going to celebrate. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Jonah did it. He arose. He went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. It's just great to start thinking, man, my fresh start, here's what it's going to be. Obedience to Jesus, and I'm going to walk and live my life according to the word of God. How simple would that be? Sometimes we just need simplicity. You can't do everything in your life. You can't. You can't be about everything. You can't be about every single, you know, and there's so much pressure these days in social media, right, to say nothing is to say everything. You're complicit. You're complicit. It's like if we follow those lines, you're going to be so stressed out. Do a few things well. Just camp. I was talking to my wife about that. There are so many things that I want to do, want to see build out of our church and schools formed and churches planted and all of this stuff. And at the end of the day, I do not want it to stretch me out from this church being healthy, our marriage being awesome, and our kids growing as much as we're able to lead in that process them towards Jesus. Like, that's how we need to live. And if the Lord allows us extra bandwidth, let's do those things, but let's do it with caution that we protect against distraction from the main things. Your main thing is obedience. You're like, well, I don't know how to obey. Right now, he's just telling you to go, so go. He's telling you to get your Bible in front of you again and read it and just one aspect of obedience from the text today. What is God calling you to do? Go walk in it. When affliction hits you because of your sin, or frankly, when you're just laid out by affliction, that's not your sin. God uses that as well. No matter what the scenario is, here's the return you need to remember over and over. Get back to the plow. Go back to where you were when the problem occurred. Okay? So if God calls you to something, and then he outs you in a tremendous chastisement of his grace in a storm, and then spits you out onto dry land, your first thought should be go back to where the disobedience was in the first place. Go back and do something about that. You know, um, I preached um, Jesus' uh, words to the church in Ephesus in the book of Revelation, and what does he say to him? He says he, they had lost their first love, but what is his call? He says, I want you to go back, and I want you to do what? The works you did at first. I need you to go back to where you were disobedient, and I need you to do the opposite thing this time. That's what I want you to do. Do what I've asked you to do. Now, here's what makes that hard. Here's what makes that hard for us. Lingering self-pity makes that hard. Massive regrets about letting God down makes that hard. Have you felt that? Lingering sorrow still from your backsliding, wondering if you're even up for the job. Listen, if God has called you into the job, it's never been about you ultimately, but still at the same time, he was beelining for Jonah. So he's not thinking there's something special in Jonah, but he wanted something done through Jonah. And so he comes back to Jonah and the question is, what's our response going to be? Not lingering, use all the lingering sorrow to walk forward when you don't know what the message is going to be by faith. Do what Paul does, and we covered this in the small group training yesterday. Do what Paul does in Philippians 3 when he goes, listen, one thing I do, one thing I know, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. What I'm saying is do not wallow in the waywardness of your yesterday. Take the mercies that God's given you, which by the way, he has given you tremendous mercy if you're still here and still breathing. Wages of sin is death, that's justice. Everything else is grace. If you're still breathing, you're living in God's grace. Take that mercy, take soft hearts that lead to open ears, Listen to the word of the Lord and by grace, strain forward in grace-driven obedience. That's what Jonah's doing. He arose and he's going. And the idea of these two verbs, he arose and he went, they carry with it this intensity of determination. One thing, moving forward in obedience. That's all I'm going to do. That's what my Christian life's going to look like right now. I am going to move forward in in obedience. The past, 
Not even worried about the past. Why? I've repented of my sin. I trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He's paid for all my sin, past, present, and future. When I surrendered my life to Jesus and received by faith the free gift of his life, perfectly lived the life I didn't live, his death substitutionarily in my place for my sin and his resurrection, conquering sin and death. When I received the work of Jesus Christ on my behalf, I was confident in that moment he was forgiving every one of my sins, not just the sins I had committed in the past up to the point of receiving Jesus Christ, but every single subsequent sin I would ever commit perfectly covered by the work of Jesus Christ. So my past is forgiven. I don't have to worry about it. I don't even think about it. I forget what lies behind. Instead, I strain forward to what lies ahead, and I do that empowered to go a new way, not west like he went to Tarshish, which is the comfortable route, but northeast, which is the way to Nineveh, the missional route. God's calling you to mission. God's calling Jonah to mission and Fresh start obedience on mission to Jesus will be costly. The question is, have you counted the cost? He's somewhere 500 miles away from where he needed to be. Okay? And he didn't have a car or a plane. So he's schlepping it like 25 miles a day, which would be a good pace. How many are like 25 miles? And I, that's... One mile for 25 days is a lot. This would take like a month with pristine physical fitness. There's a cost to this. There is a reality to this as he's approaching with every step of what he's going to be doing. Following Jesus in obedience leads you to mission, and there's going to be a cost to that. The question is, where does the strength come from to make that sacrifice? And again, I draw it back to the whole driving purpose of this book is mercy. It's God's mercy. It's the driving force behind the gospel. Once you know the gospel, once you've seen it in its fullness, this is why Paul says in Romans chapter 12, therefore I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God to present yourselves as living sacrifices. What mobilizes that kind of life? It's mercies. Jonah didn't go the first time with mercy because he didn't know mercy. Jonah wasn't able to extend compassion because he had no comprehension of his own sinfulness. He had no comprehension of what it felt like to be separated from God, and he definitely, therefore, had no deep understanding of what it's like to be just consumed by the grace of God in Jesus. Now, of course, he would be trusting in the promise of the Messiah to come, but we, in knowing and seeing Jesus for who he is, that's what it should look like for us in Jesus Christ. Mercy mobilizes us. That's what we've been talking about. So what's the direction onward? What's the mission? Preach what God tells you. What's the word? I'm not sure yet, but he says he'll supply it. So I go trusting him. Isn't that the life of the Christian? Isn't that how we should live? He, he's going <laughs> to, he's going to go on And like I said, not perfectly obey. He's got remaining sin wrapped around his heart like the seaweed that was wrapped around his face in the ocean. If that isn't a picture for us to think about our own hearts, isn't this? The story of Jonah is so encouraging because the sign of our being saved is actually one of them in the Bible is that we'd actually obey and hear the word of God. But isn't it tremendous that we're going to learn through Jonah that he's going to botch some moments of obedience and um, we're going to botch some moments of obedience too. But yet at the end of the day, what's going to make our evidence of salvation clear is that we return to the Lord, open ears, soft heart to obedience. That will be the sign, not the perfection of our lives. That isn't the point, but it ought to look like a pattern ever increasingly in obedience. Yes, we will have slip-ups, but then we die in that moment again 
We receive the power of Jesus' death in our place in his subsequent resurrection to remind ourselves we are no longer who we used to be. We are no longer even here. It's God who lives in us. And therefore, by the power of the Holy Spirit, through the work of the mercy of the gospel, we go forward. And of course, in this, it sets the stage for a move of God. A kind of revival is going to break out through this reformed, reluctant servant whom the Lord has made ready for this kingdom responsibility. Let's pray. Father, it is a a really helpful picture and image to think about going back to a start, to the start, and thinking, man, what do you require of us but grace-driven obedience? We know this is all by grace to begin with. Every fresh start is an opportunity to see it for what it is, which is your grace. You're getting us an opportunity to be restored right back into that, re-enlisted to that work. And it starts as simply as one foot in front of the other. One step of obedience to another step of obedience to another step of obedience. Little by little accumulating in our life until that becomes a pattern. Yes, there are setbacks, but God, I'm praying for patterns I'm praying for consistency. I'm praying for these people here, for all of us, for myself, that when we stray, we would repent and return and re-engage. Open ears, open heart, willing obedience. Where you send us, we'll go. What you want us to say, we don't know, but we trust you. Father, I pray that you would just continue to draw lost people to yourself, that they might see in Jesus a tremendous grace, a God of many chances. May there be a reminder of your kindness and your goodness and your mercy, and would you draw people to your son, Jesus Christ, that they might turn from their sin, call out to you for mercy, which will be abundantly theirs should they come to trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So Father, do that work that I can't do in the hearts of those here. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.